So I can start anyway. Okay. So in 2017, so between 2014 and even before when I finished my PhD, I, um, I started to work in Africa, as uh, you mentioned before, in Africa, Latin America, trying to evaluate uh, experiences of community engagement are in, in very poor communities, like in favelas, in Brazil, uh, rural areas, rural schools, um, rural um, NGOs projects in Africa, especially in Uganda and Kenya in slums. That has been my work uh, in the, that's great. That has been my work in between 2009 up to 2016, 17. In, uh, so you can go to the first slide, which is the second slide. Um, so I can start from that. Okay. Okay, just a second. It's taking some time. It's a bit slow, but uh, I'll get to the second slide. <laughs> okay. So, so basically in 2017, um, I was trying to, to see if there was a possibility to work closely to Europe and what was happening in Europe. Um, and I was struck by the fact that from 2013, 14, there were so many migrants arriving on the shores of Italy and, uh, and dying in the Mediterranean Sea. And, um, and I was also looking at what the Pope, Pope Francis was, was kept saying that we need to do more for migrants and uh, that they're arriving in Europe. So I asked my university to go to Lampedusa for two weeks, this little island very close, closer to Africa than to Italy. And I, I went there in 2017 for two weeks, trying to just understand and to leave uh, what was happening there in that period. So the um, migrants were still arriving many not like in 2011 where there was this immense flow of migrants because of their arab spring and uh, there were more migrants than inhabitants in the island of lampedusa in 2011. in 2017 uh, there were migrants still arriving and uh, rescued by the coast guard of italy and um, and I was able to see them. So the picture that you see are my pictures. In 2017, I was on the harbor in Lampedusa early in the morning at 6 a.m. and I took that picture. And also in Lampedusa, I don't know if you if you went there, but there is this uh, sculpture that is called the the door of you uh, the door of Europe, and it's basically a door um, and highlighting the fact that Europe would like to be an open space, an open door for people arriving. Go to the next one. And that uh, also, I took this picture in 2017, in those two weeks I was there, there was the procession of Corpus Domini, a religious event, Catholic religious event happening in June. And I was part of the procession. And at a certain point I, I came out of the crowd and I saw these six people I met the, the night before on this street, that is the main street in Lampedusa. And I met these, six, uh, these five migrants. They were just arrived in the island from Bangladesh. I was not able to even talk with them in English. I was trying French, Portuguese, all the languages I, I know, and they were not able to say anything to me. And then I asked myself, how can we communicate with these people? If we, how, and, and when I saw the procession, I saw them, I took this picture, and then I looking at it, I start to ask myself, how can, how they would be able in the next few years, days, to encounter even the tradition we have in Europe, even like this procession, the culture, how they would be able to encounter the people? How, what does it, 
what what is the challenge there? So I start to ask myself all these questions and also looking back at the picture when I was back at the university, I also saw in the picture, you see on the right, this group of tourists. And I asked myself, do they understand what's, what is happening there still? So to me, this picture is, is really interesting because it's a, it's a way to, um, to look at the different traditions, different cultures, different people and ask, can we encounter each other, each, each other uh, again? Go to the next one. Not just migrants and refugees, but also between our tradition. So, and what does he, what is at stake there? What is the challenge there? And what is the freedom in that? So, uh, when I went back after my two weeks in Lampedusa, I, I just got, uh, went to Rome and I, and I met all the organizations in Italy, in Rome, working with migrants and refugees. And one of the organizations I met was Caritas. And the responsible of Caritas told me, that was 2017, and said to me, look, in two months, we are going to start with the Italian ministry, the humanitarian corridors project. And, I, uh, and they, he said, we are going to bring from Ethiopia uh, 500 um, refugees in collaboration with the UNHCR, which is the agency of the UN for refugees. And we are going to do this project for two years and we are going to spread the, the, migrant, the, the refugees all around Italy. And I went back to the university and I asked my team, would you, I think would be a great opportunity for us to understand, to evaluate to, to build the collabor external collaborators of this project and try to understand if that could be a solution for welcoming in a safe and legal way refugees to Italy or and in general to Europe. So we started a kind of one year pilot project. Go to the next one. Um, uh, try to understand if the humanitarian corridor project, which is, a, uh, I don't know if you know, but is a, a program that is close to the uh, sponsorship program uh, that there um, is, a, is, is a kind of program that is more well known in Canada where sponsor, private sponsor, communities, ethnic groups can sponsor um, family members and migrants to come in a safe and legal way. So we travel visa to the third country without going through all the, what we, what is really dangerous, which is what is telling this picture. The normal way now, for example, to reach Europe is not through visas, but is basically uh, crossing either the Mediterranean Sea, as you can see, from, uh, the, from Libya to, to, to arrive in Italy, you cross the sea through and with the help of smugglers. Or you go on the, on the east side and you go to the, to the Balkan route, or you go from Spain to the um, west route, like the, the, the route from Morocco and then Spain. The most dangerous way to reach Europe is actually the central Mediterranean route, which is through Libya and uh, Italy. It's the most dangerous. Many people die there, and, um, but it's, it's, still, uh, it's still happening. Go to the next one. So I, this morning I look at the, at the data uh, the most recent data of how many migrants reach the, the, the shores of Italy to, uh, uh, from the beginning of this year, January, the 1st of January up to now. So just 15 days, or no, we are 19 now. 19 days we have uh, in 2022. So in the middle of the pandemic, still 400 
more or less 400 ref, uh, migrants that try to reach that cross the, the, the Mediterranean Sea to, to reach Italy. And you can tell that the pandemic is not stopping them. Uh, probably in 2018, 2017, there were the double of uh, migrants trying to reach, but still there are people trying to reach, even though the pandemic is going on, even though there are restrictions. Go to the next one. And you see, this is the time frame of an entire year. Now we are just with the green one in, uh, in January. So is compared to the, the last two years, the amount of people reaching Italy is, is smaller. But to me, it's really interesting to see that if you, if you look at the red one, in the middle of the pandemic, which it was last year, how many people, especially during the summertime last year, tried and reached Italy through crossing and risking their lives. Go to the next one. The, the people trying now to reach, of course, there are people from Afghanistan because this is the place where uh, what, the, 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 um, what happened last year with the withdrawal of the US tro tro troops from Afghanistan and the mess that created that situation, those are the people now trying to reach, to, to, to escape and flee from their country. But there are also other, uh, like Bangladesh and other countries that we don't think that they're gonna, through all this journey to arrive to Libya and cross, like Bangladesh. How many of you think that Bangladesh people are reaching Europe through the central route and risking their life in this way. Uh, and of course, people from Tunisia and Algeria, that is very close. Next one. So basically to avoid these, um, these danger routes uh, and to give the possibilities to refugees to reach Europe in a safe and legal way, uh, the Italian government in agreement with the Ethiopian government. And before that, um, from, there were people arriving from Lebanon with, with the community of Sant'Egidio. But in this particular program, I follow 500 refugees reaching Italy through these, um, these corridors from Ethiopia. Basically what the governments are trying to do is is to do this um, temporary visa that allow the people to arrive by plane, not risking their lives crossing the sea and arrive in Italy and then applies, apply as asylum seekers to permanent visa. These people are, were people in refugee camps in e Ethiopia and basically they were from Eritrea, Somalia and South Sudan. Uh, next one. The, so the majority of these people were from Eritrea, probably 80% of people from Eritrea and then a few from South Sudan and Somalia. What is really interesting of this project is the selection that is made in refugee camps and with the help of um, local organizations like Gandhi Charity, um, and with the help of the UN, the United Nations through UNHCR, the Agency for Refugees. The selection is based on vulnerability. So people that are families that have just one parent or uh, people that uh, have disabilities or people that they suffer from violence um, and any sort of violence uh, caused by gender issues, religion, uh, persecution. And those are criteria of the UNHCR. And what Caritas was in really a peculiar aspect of the humanitarian corridor project was the matching phase, trying to match the, the needs of, the, of these vulnerable people with the resources in the communities in Italy. So for example, a person that was blind 
or is blind to match in a community where there is a service for um, blind people, for example, or if a person is deaf, can't uh, speak and um, like there were children not able to speak and to listen to hear and they were uh, this family was put in a center close to Biella where there is a, um, a sign language school for sp specialized for children with that, with those problems. So this matching the, the need with the resources in the Italian uh, territory, which was really interesting. And then this accompaniment, which is accompanying with tutor, with what we call mentors and volunteers, the process of integration. Next one. So in, Eto in Ethiopia, they had interviews. This is in the picture, you see the, the head of the Italian um, Caritas responsible of the humanitarian corridors, Daniele Albanese, which was in encountering and interviewing one of the candidates to come to to Italy through this project. So there is a pre-departure. So this, the refugees are trying to understand the culture, trying to learn some Italian before coming, medical check, security check. So it's not that you, uh, what is interesting, you don't uh, just select random the refugees, but there is a process of um, uh, introducing them to the society and the culture in, in Europe, the, uh, the social norms, the rules, and in agreement, like they is a cultural orientation and also trying to make them responsible for the future integration. Next one. And then in Italy, the same, the communities. So, um, this program was uh, built also through Caritas with the call of, in, I don't know if you remember, but Pope Francis in 2015 um, started to tell everybody in the Catholic Church saying we need to open the doors. We need to open our convent, we need to open our churches and many um, parishes uh, responded to that call saying we would love to offer the possibility for migrants and refugees to come and when they they knew about the possibility the diocese the bishops knew about the possibility of the humanitarian corridors they they said to caritas we are willing to welcome so in italy there was this wave of in the parishes of we want to offer the possibility of uh, giving their homes that maybe they're empty in our parishes. And so there was this also pre-arrival community preparation and many dioceses opened the possibility for the corridors with many volunteers um, uh, willing to welcome. Next. And so that was before the arrival. And so um, it was one year of support um, is a private sponsorship model so with the state but with also all the participation of the civic society and then they sign a contract which is really interesting because they have to do, do is a mutual responsible project i mean integration is mutual you need you need the the, the migrants are uh, refugees arriving and and be responsible of their integration but is also the the other side that needs to uh, accompany them and then next one is uh, so is really interesting because is a is a in italy this program was spread all around the italian um, territory so there was a territorial diffusion everywhere which has pro and cons because as you know Italy is very is richer on the north side of Italy and is poorer on the south and so for integration purposes it's really hard for refugees and for people accompanying them to to find jobs for them in the especially in the south of Italy can you go to the next one so this is the territorial diffusion next one 
I did the first year between 2017, 2018, I did more than 400 interviews. I, I met bishops, refugees, directors, volunteers all over the country. Next one. So we, I basically went everywhere. And the questions I asked were, is welcoming really possible? What does accompany mean? Accompaniment. What does it mean to accompany somebody to his or her freedom? What does it mean to make them independent and not um, dependent of our help? What does it mean to, what are the challenges? Is there an encounter or mostly is a clash? We can't understand. You remember the first picture? How these people so different can understand another culture, our traditions, is really an encounter is possible or not? What does it mean to integrate? What does it mean the freedom to integrate from both sides? Next one. And um, in all of this journey, I, uh, it was a journey for me as well. I met photographers and video makers and, and people in the area of media. And with them, I, to, to understand all these questions, I built up um, a sort of documentary, a, a sort of a website that you can, after this presentation and maybe with your teachers, you can go back and look at the stories. I'm gonna try to summarize, summarize some of them right now. But I tried to see in reality, integration, what, what meant integration in the last, so from 2018 up to now, so in the last four years, these 500 ref, refugees, how many were able to stay in Italy? What were the challenges? not just for the refugees, but also for the local communities. Go to the next one. So for example, this guy, the, the child you see, um, couldn't hear and speak. He was deaf. And uh, as a matching, they put him in a, in a school very close to Biella, where is the best school for deaf people. So in one year, the, the one year they stay, the family stayed in, uh, in close to Biella, uh, he, he was able to start to speak in Italian with the sign language. So it was the best matching, if you want, the perfect example of uh, success, uh, matching integration, the, um, the, the, the boy was able to communicate, for the first time in his life, and he was happy. At a certain point, the, the, the father um, escaped with the two brothers and tried to go to uh, Germany. And he succeeded, he went to Germany. And uh, the, the mother with the other kids uh, decided to follow him and to start again. They arrived then in the Netherlands actually not in the Netherlands, in Brussels, and they, they went away. Uh, as the project succeeds, so from our point of view, it was, and for the point of view, actually, for the point of view of the volunteers and the local caritas was not a success because they kept saying to me, we gave to them the best of what we can offer and they deny that, they want to, continue their life in the Netherlands. And uh, now they have to start all over again. The sign language is different for each country. He's, he, he learned how to speak in Italian and now is a new word. In fact, this little boy was so despaired that he started to have traumas. And so uh, the question is, we can do the best and to find the best solution for the child. But then the, the parents decide something else is, and is their freedom. So how can we stop their freedom to choose to live in another country because we believe is the best for the, the kid, what we offer him was the best and he needs to integrate in Italy because there is no way. So to me, all these questions are still open but it's also the mystery to let them 
go if they want to go. So the mystery of freedom to decide for their future uh, and the best for their family that we don't know exactly how and, uh, and how that would entail in the future. But I'm not, we are not able just to judge on, on what we see that is the best, what we think for them. Next one. So this is another example. This guy is, uh, he was um, resettled in, uh, in Tuscany, um, ac uh, actually in Umbria, close to Assisi, so in Bastia Umbra. And uh, a blind guy with many um, physical difficulties, but the most, the one that I think the, the, the person that for me was the most independent person I ever met in my life. Now, after four years, he lived by himself. He, he got to the university. He finished the program at the university. And he kept to say to, to us, I want my independence. Um, the people of Caritas, they are too close to me. I, I appreciate the accompaniment, but I want to be free. And uh, so it's interesting how much, uh, for example, a community would, the desire is to, um, to be closer and closer to uh, a person that you, you see fragile because it, it doesn't see, you think is, uh, it needs, all of your help, and then instead, from the other side, you want independence, and it doesn't understand that why you are so um, uh, I don't know any in, in English the right word to say, but so uh, unwilling to let them go on his way. So again, is this clash between our desire to arrange a life of the other or to think we know what this person needs because it's so fragile and the other side a person that the only desire he has is to be completely independent right away even though um, he has difficulties or disabilities the next one all of these I didn't mention, but all of these stories you can find on the website and there are videos of that. So this is another guy that was uh, arrived in 2018. He was, uh, he was put in a very small um, uh, village close to Verona. And uh, he was 16, 17 when he arrived. One, one day, one of the people in the village that was uh, the owner of a pastry shop, a gelateria in Italy, saw him outside the gelateria, the pastry shop, and he, and he, he asked him, do you need something? Do, so he started to invite him, and at a certain point, he offered him a job. And for a summer and even more, he worked at the, at the pastry shop and basically the family of the owner took care of him and his brother and they became really friends. A certain point out of the blue without saying anything, he decided to escape and go again to Brussels and Belgium, escaping after two years that he was mostly integrated in the Italian society, in new Italian, he had a job, he had a Everything you can imagine was great for him to integrate, but he decided to go. And the volunteers and the owner of the pastry shop couldn't, couldn't understand why. Why this person, we gave him everything and still needs more. Next one. And this is another example of a, a Keria, a mother, Eritrean woman. She was, um, she found a job in the close to Verona, she she was able to start to work, earn some money, 
And then there was this group of volunteers helping her with the, the children. And she, she was struggling uh, and, and not understanding again the her role of a parent. Um, because the, one of the interesting things about migration and refugees is that uh, people, so the, the, the children start to learn Italian very easily. They know they are actually able to learn the language faster than the parents. And they, they become the translators for the parents. And there is a, an inversion of the roles in inside the families. And, and the parents start to rethink about the roles. They don't believe themselves very useful. And they start to think we are useless. We don't, we don't have our role of authority anymore. And that's why uh, they struggle much more than the second generation, the children to integrate in a society because of the past traumas, but the trauma not to have the role of parents anymore. And we saw all over these four years, that was one of the big issues of many parents, uh, especially the parents that they're less there they have struggles with education because they didn't have an education before they lived in refugee camps for more than 15 years they are not able to know how to work anymore so even if they offer them a job they are not able to keep the job and so they basically feel useless and this is one of the traumas of refugees and migrants that especially uh, for refugees more than for migrants, because the migrants that they come to Europe for economic reasons, they're the strongest. They want to work and they want to contribute for the community. Instead, the refugees, that they are the poorest and the most vulnerable, 90% of the time they struggle to find a job because of their vulnerability and the fact that they maybe live for 15 years in a refugee camp um, refugee camp without having had the possibility of working. They don't know how to work anymore. And, and this is a struggle for Europe that receiving these mo the most vulnerable uh, is like, should we, um, how can we keep them independent then? They're gonna need our help more and more. And, um, and what does it mean for integration is another challenge. Next one. And then this, this is a, a more positive because now you, you saw all the, the challenges because there are many, because this is, re, uh, migration is a complex issue. It's not simple. There is no one solution. But there are some people that because of the community they found, because of the, also because of their personalities, because sometimes it's also a question of personalities, not just vulnerability on, but a person is a mystery, is, is not numbers. That's why I wanted to show you faces because migrants and refugees are faces, is a mystery, is like us. We have, we are complex and those are people, complex. And this guy, was uh, you look at the story is fascinating he was um, he, we actually took his drawings he was he drew his history his story through drawings and now he's in um, in Nonantole close to Modena with his family and the family of his brother and he's the happiest guy I, I'm, I've ever met he, he also gave to me one of his paintings and is basically the, 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 the Caritas social workers there and their families are, became friends and is now a, a, a mentor for other uh, families too, um, refugee families too. Next one. Yeah, so this is what I wanted to introduce you with these slides and with this presentation. I if you have questions. So the, to conclude the most, um, what I just said that my, I mean, integration, migration is a, one of the most complex phenomenon we are 
call to answer. Because we are talking about people and people are missed. This, they are mysterious. There is a mystery in each one of us and a mystery of freedom in, because you can offer, as we saw, we, you can offer the best solution according to our criteria and maybe these people are looking for something else. And so what does it mean in the end to accompany, not just them, but to accompany ourselves in this journey? I see integration as a journey. It's not that they need to integrate for sure in our society. Maybe we just give them the possibility for a moment to stay in our territory but then they need to move somewhere, somewhere else for their future. So it's just a question maybe temporary of, we accompany each other for a while and we give you our friendship and our connections and our um, uh, willingness to know each other. But then it's a journey of what is next for you and for me. And when there is this openness to encounter the other, then there is the possibility of growth and integration or inclusion. Or um, if it's not, then is um, I see the clash coming up or the frustration because these we uh, many volunteers that were not in this open position, they were saying we gave to them everything and now they decide to go away. So what, this, what does it mean in the end to welcome? So that's why I, I think uh, the challenge of freedom and the challenge of see each other as um, people in search with an infinite desire that we can't answer is the best way to look at this phenomenon. I would stop here. If you have questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you so much. It was so deep. Thank you, uh, Ilaria. So let's let's uh, move on with the questions. I know that uh, there are many. Did you understand? Silence. Ah, see. Where, where are the questions that uh, uh, Prof. Beretta students uh, prepared? Good evening. Oh, Hi. fantastic. Good evening. Finally. Um, video, video. Okay, video. sorry. Oh, yes. what a Good beautiful evening. boy. Thank you. <laughs> um, why, uh, I have a question for Ilaria. Why do you have yeah. chosen uh, uh, to pursue this career? So I was, since I was a, a teenager, at your age, I was fascinated by the world, uh, about traveling and encountering people from different cultures. So that was uh, one of the things, and probably also because I have uncles and family members that they were, one he was in Nicaragua and uh, in Latin America working, and one another was in uh, in Africa as a medical doctor, and I was fascinated by their by their work, the fact they were helping, the fact that they were not just seeing they were like open up to something new and explore how to to spend their life in a meaningful way, but open to to the war. That fascinated me so much that when I had to pick uh, what to study, and in the other part of the family, they were diplomats. So again, an open 
window to the world. And I said, I want this openness. I want to explore what is up there to me. And, and that's why I started to look at international relations, um, international relation kind of studies, the possibility to go and explore um, how to help people in the world, not just thinking about myself because I wanted to be in my life meaningful. And so, um, and then this fascination for, uh, yeah, I think not just Europe, but the outside. Thank you very much. You're well. How many languages do you speak, uh, Ilaria? I speak French, Italian, and English well, but then I have a work knowledge of Spanish and Brazilian Portuguese. And also uh, German. German, I started, I mean, I'm from Switzerland, so you know, <laughs> learned German at school, but then I forgot it because I, I never went to, you, in Switzerland, you have to choose when you are 18. Either you go to a university in the German side of Switzerland and then you learn German. But I decided to go to Geneva because of my international studies. And then in Geneva is French and English. So basically I lost German, but I'm not, I'm, I'm happy for that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that because they are, uh, some of them have to study German. No, but is I think is a personal choice. I would love to, to know German actually because it's, it's really bad to have a German last name and not speak German well. <laughs> That's so true. I would love to learn German better. At some point in my life, I would go back. Yeah, and... you are young, so you can, you can learn. Forza, forza! Another question. I have two questions. Oh, beautiful. Video, uh, video. Uh, I don't know how to eh, put the Push video. the button under the... Wait a second, please. Yeah. No? No? Adesso I, I messo il muto. Unmute. Sì, prof, sto cercando le impostazioni per riuscire a mettere il video. Ma sotto c'è il bottoncino dove c'è sì, il video. Sì, è che non me lo fa accendere. Mi dice ah, per questione di privacy. Peccato. Vabbè, facci la domanda così. Ok. The first one is, have you ever grown fond of someone you were helping? Uh, can you repeat, sorry? Have you ever grown fond of someone you were helping? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, I developed many, you, you'd say many relations, I mean, friendship, for example, in that sense. Oh, Maybe yes. I misunderstood the question. Yeah, yes, is in that sense. No, well, because you I, were helping people. Yeah, I mean, for example, in 2018, when I visited the first time a refugee camp in Ethiopia, one of the guides that was helping us to go around the refugee camp, because you it's not that you go to a refugee camp and then you go around. You need somebody to introduce you to to go around to the tents, to the and there was this young um, Eritrean woman that she tried, I don't know, so many times to, to flee from the refugee camps. It was kidnapped. It was, she was kidnapped in Sudan. They sent back from Sudan to Ethiopia again. She tried to go to um, take a flight. She went to Malaysia. Malaysia put her in prison. They, they bring her back to Uganda and then Ethiopia and put ba her back to refugee camps. She was raped. She oh. was raped many times. She was traumatized. And she was helping us because she knew English. 
And then at the end of this visit, she said to us, me and I'm a researcher, I don't have any power, but she was asking one of the journalists that was with us in that trip, she is a journalist in, in TV, TV, TV 2000, si. yes. in Italy. And this guy, uh, with this guy and the guy of Caritas there, we tried to see if there was a possibility for her to be to to be one of in one of the corridors she was not selected at the beginning but because of of her story we we try to to help that process of having her in one of the corridors and a few months later she was put in one of the lists and now she since 2018 she she live in Assisi she lives oh, in Assisi. And so last November, when I visited Assisi again, and I visited the diocese and the work of Caritas in Assisi, I met her. She gave, and I visited her many times. We became very, very good friends. She, the last time, I mean, the previous time in 2018, 19, when I visited her in Assisi the first time, she, she brought with her, um, the traditional coffee instrument to make coffee from scratch. So smashing the coffee and then they have a pot with a fire under it. And this is the traditional way to do coffee in Ethiopia and Eritrea. And all of the families coming from Eritrea and Ethiopia, they bring, they don't bring clothes, they don't bring anything special, <laughs> but it, it's like Italians when they go around, they bring <laughs> the mocha with them. And this lady, she, she brought us many other families, the, all the tools to do the, the Ethiopian Eritrean coffee. But last time when I visited her in November last year, two months ago, she was making coffee with the mocha. <laughs> and I said to her, you, you, you are becoming Italian right now. And we laughed a lot. Uh, so, of course, we... If you are human, and if you do a, a work like mine, that is basically interacting with people, you, you end up to make friendships, to be closer to them. They become part of your journey. Yesterday, uh, one of the refugees called me and asked, how are you doing? Uh, why you don't visit us anymore? Um, how is your family? I mean, they become part of your journey. And I have tons of friends in Facebook that they're refugees now all over Europe. And I'm sure if I go back and visit them, it's like, because one of the beautiful things of my work has been to travel with them. So from Ethiopia to Italy, I was in these trips in the, in the plane with them. So basically for them, I was part of their journey. You become part of their journey. We become um, very close. Uh, and uh, there are others that maybe they ask me, I'm in Como right now. Uh, do you know a way to work in Switzerland? I mean, I've, I'm in the US. <laughs> How can I help you? So in a sense, you, you, I feel myself some somehow helpless because I don't have all the tools. What I can do is maybe offering, talk to this person, talk to the other person and make connections. And this, and then is up to the, to God, what is, is provided because uh, what we can offer each other is a friendship in the end. And, and also, yeah, the the warm the warmth of visiting them back if possible but if for one second you get you you can look at them in a way that is open they stay with you forever uh, and that is the the real encounter could be one second but many of them that i just met one second they became part of my life and they reached me out after years because of that second.
Thank you very much. And I wanted to ask you another question. I may know the, the answer, but as you said before, your job is to interact with others and you may learn something with others. So I wanted to ask you, after this experience, has something changed in your life? Maybe in the way you take care of people or in general in your soul? Oh, yeah. Um, my work in the last 15 years, I, I think I've been, has been transformational in terms of looking at my, my life. I mean, um, if you meet these people, if you actually know them, they, the way that everything is um, like temporary in the sense that you don't have anything, but you have your heart and you have, uh, because materially these people that don't, they, they, they flee from their country without anything. And so to me, this, um, the fact, or even though before working with refugees, when I went, I went in many poor communities in Africa and the fact that many of these women without having material um, possessions or they had they had they are happy that for me was one of the things that challenged me uh, when back when i'm back in my in my community like i have everything i'm not happy so for me for example this has changed the way i'm living because I need to ask myself when I'm complaining uh, about everything, why? What do I need to be happy in the end? So in that way, they change me every day because they maybe don't have what I have, but they have the desire of uh, fulfillment and the, and actually the the open and the openness of uh, thanking God for what they have because they are really religious people even if they don't believe they are um, in search of for something so they are spiritual and religious in a, in that sense in search for meaning and this openness is something that sometimes I don't have. And so that's why you are interesting for me and challenge me and transform me. So I'm shaped and reshaped in all of these encounters, if I'm open. And transform my way to look at my work, transform my way to look at my friendship, transform the way of looking at myself. Thank you very much. Wow, <laughs> this this is the the we are we are listening something that is crucial for our lives, you know. Forza, I have a question too. Wow, ah, uh, yeah. beautiful. Uh, my question is: uh, Has a foreign government ever tried to help this procedure? Another government, do you say? Yeah, has a foreign government ever tried to help this procedure? What do you mean? Because I um, don't know if, if uh, another country has ever tried to help this procedure. Yeah, so the humanitarian corridors are now trying to... Um, so Italy started with the community of Sant'Egidio in 2015, then Caritas uh, do the same. In Canada, these programs like the, is not the same as the humanitarian corridor, but they are doing this since 40 years. Um, in Europe, there, there is Belgium, France, Spain, Germany, and the UK that have been built similar programs in their countries with the help of governments, because it's like a private, um, a private um, initiative. 
like with Caritas in Italy, for example, Caritas in Belgium or uh, Caritas in Germany or in the UK. I visited some of these projects, even in Ireland. Um, so there are some initiatives, but they're very small because if we compare the numbers, I mean, people crossing the Mediterranean Sea, I mean, these years because of the pandemic are less, but in 2017, they were just in, in the Mediterranean Sea, I think 100,000 people crossing. The humanitarian corridors, the one I'm following is 500 people. It's a drop in the ocean. If you, if you see the numbers, it's nothing compared to the need. So if you ask me if the solution is that one, yeah, if we do a lot more of corridors, is that possible? Who knows? Because you need a lot of people to do that. You need tons of volunteers. You need tons of uh, regions. You need jobs. You need the private sector coming in and offering jobs. Do we want that? I mean, and then we enter in all of these uh, challenge of uh, we need them because we need for democratic demographic issues we need more people because Europe is dying. Uh, we need people that do jobs that we don't want to do anymore. So those are big challenges that Europe needs to answer. But the humanitarian corridor as a project is very small compared to the need. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Another one. Oh. Where are all the questions? <clears throat> so maybe we can also open up to questions from can you can you hear me we we can hear echo okay now yes yes so maybe we can open up questions also from other classes if they want to yeah of course and if, um, if they want to to write question on the chat feel free to do it yes. I, I don't think that you can you cannot have questions after what Ilaria told us it's impossible uh, <clears throat> if you are not stones of course if you are stones you don't have questions or trees, but if you are humans. You can write on in the chat. Is it open also to professors? Because I would love to... Okay, go, go. Um, which of the countries involved in... We, can, we can't hear very well. Speak closer to the me? mic. Yeah. Uh, which are the other countries involved in this project? Like you said, Ethiopia and... Uh... Oh, Lebanon. Mm -hmm. um, Caritas the, in the last two years worked with Niger because there were um, corridors, emergency corridors, also from Libya. There were emergency corridors. If you look at the website, so I didn't tell you, but... Also, you go to my website that is human, and you can use that in the classes. But there, there was two interviews of the UNHCR representative in Niger, where Caritas did some corridors from Niger. They, they started a new corridor from Jordan for Iraqis and Afghani. Uh, refugees, they are going to start a new one after the Afghan situation. 
Afghanistan situation from Pakistan, probably, because they need to find a, a country that allows corridors and probably is not Iran, but possibly is Pakistan. But I don't know, I haven't spoken with the Caritas since a while, so I don't know uh, if they're started that or not. But those more or less are the countries, so Niger, Jordan, Lebanon, Libya for emergency corridors, and now with Afghanistan, probably Pakistan. Thank you. Oh, one question in the chat. The chat. How do you know? This meeting is being recorded. Okay. <clears throat> How do you when, when you're ONG, you, when the, the, um, you mean the refugees complete the journeys or the, what do you mean? If you, if you can uh, explain a bit better, the question would be helpful. <clears throat> Bedetti, puoi parlare? No. You know, so, this is the, the Italian, uh, Italian youth, the situation of Italian youth, unfortunately. <clears throat> they so don't the have questions, which is uh, one of the worst uh, things uh, that uh, can happen to a human being, you know. Uh, what uh, what uh, were you saying, I mean, Barry? So, what does it mean to complete a journey? We <laughs> never. We I don't think we we are always journeying. So, hopefully, they're not completing their journeys. <laughs> if you have a desire, you don't stop. So that's why the like a migrants and refugees that they or the encounter between volunteers and when she completes a job um i mean for sure i'm happy if somebody in that is coming to italy and get a job and is happy and is integrating i'm super happy yesterday one of these refugees called me to say Look, I'm working uh, I, because I asked him why your cousin left after four years. The kids were going to school. They would learn Italian. She was always, she was one of the, 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 the daughters were, was in high school. And she was basically succeeding. And the mom, because of her struggle, left. And so is for our mindset is impossible to think now they have to start again all over in Germany for these kids that they were basically integrated. And so you can't understand. Uh, but at the same time, and the, the, the volunteers can't understand either. They are frustrated because they said, why? Why they, they live now after three, four years? So do, did they complete their journey? Uh, for example, this is an example. The mother was not working, so the kids were integrating, the mother not. So uh, she thinks that it's better for the family to go to Germany and depend for the social welfare in Germany, because this is what is going to happen. They're going to be they're going to be put in a center and a shelter in Germany and start all over again and so be dependent. 
instead being in Italy, they were supported by the local community and slowly make step after step. And maybe with the trauma for the mother not able to work, but with the possibility for the children to one day be independent. So those are choices and um, is uh, the question of when is, uh, is the journey complete or is, is up to what does it mean to be uh, to journey because we never stop even if you find the best job in your life you never stop if you if your desire is 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 open so right now for example they didn't renew my contract oh no and so i am in this journey to understand what's next so should i stay in the us should i should i go back to europe uh, so in a sense, this, this journey never stops. It's not just for refugees or for migrants. If you, if you find a job in, and the best job of your life is enough, uh, two years from now, you can maybe your uh, employer decide not to renew your contract. And so again, you are, is a new challenge. But yeah. thank goodness is like this because um, I don't think there is a we, life is a journey so keeps desire alive. Okay, <clears throat> I think uh, we we have a lot to think about. Uh, in what you, you really told us, it was not just a, a speech, it was a testimony. And um, wow. I hope it was helpful. Yeah, I think uh, it, it was, uh, and uh, especially uh, what we uh, listen about uh, being open, uh, desire, have questions, don't close the horizon, you know, because this is something that we can't stop learning uh, for, for all our lives. So yes. thank you very much, Ilaria. Yeah, and if you have other questions, if you want to reach me out, even in okay. private, I'm happy to. Okay, okay. Um, uh, I'll, I'll share your, uh, your email with the student that wants to, to write you. Yeah. And maybe since uh, in, in our school they study languages, maybe uh, in the future they will, uh, uh, will follow you in, uh, in, in, uh, after this uh, inspirational uh, talk that you, you gave us, you know. That would be great. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you so much and uh, uh, with the other, we will see tomorrow at school. And uh, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you can you go, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>